Hi, this is Mrs. Warren. If you are watching this, you probably missed February 8th, 2018 on Thursday. This is our lesson today on the nullification crisis and Andrew Jackson, protective tariffs and the bank war. On page 32, this is where we did our warm up. You can go ahead and uh, test your knowledge of past information and then check with me or check with a friend when you come back to class. So go to page 33, you're going to title this Protective Tariff of 1828. Now we've talked about tariffs, a tariff is a tax on imported goods. So Britain, look down at this diagram, Britain comes over, wants to sell its $4 cloth, but ours is also $4. We want everybody to buy American brands. So we add a 25 cent tariff on and it adds a dollar to the price now british cloth is more expensive than ours that's what we want that encourages the economy and makes uh, our factory strong now this is to protect american industries so we drew this in our notebooks so on page 33 i want you to divide page 33 half whoops sorry about that halfway all right and you're going to draw this diagram um, now, as I just described to you, the North was very excited about the protective tariff. However, the South was not. Remember, all of their cotton, they're exporting. They're sending it out to other countries. And other countries say, really, you're going to add a tariff to our stuff? Well, we're going to add a tariff to your stuff. So, the South ends up losing money and was very... Uh, excuse me, very much and very allergic to the tariff. And they uh, were very mad because uh, they was taking money out of their pockets. So go ahead and draw this. You can pause the video. And if you have any questions, please ask. Um, we're going to explain what happens next in the next slide. Now go ahead and watch this video. Um, there was a continuing problem with the nullification crisis and, or excuse me, all right, let me start over. Uh, the nullification crisis was over the protective tariff. Andrew Jackson and John C. Calhoun, Jackson is the president, Calhoun is the vice president, and they become very angry <coughs> at each other about the decisions on tariffs. Please type in the Google shorten the URL up in the upper left hand corner and it will take you to this video. <coughs> After the video I want you to go ahead and write and take these notes underneath the drawing you just made. So it would be on the bottom half of page 33. This was indeed a crisis in 1832 and we almost came very very close to a civil war. The civil war doesn't actually start until 1861. Now South Carolina was a southern state that was very upset about the tariff. They threatened to secede, leave the Union. They said they nullified the tariff. To nullify means to reject. And they refused to enforce it or pay it. Now Jackson got Congress to lower the tariff, but they said not enough. So Jackson said, you better pay it or I'm going to take my army and bring it down there and we're going to, you know, I'm going to make you pay it. Now South Carolina decided to stay and they backed off a little bit because they really didn't have much uh, backup from the other southern states. And they did lower the tariff even more. John C. Calhoun quit his job as vice president to lead this charge on nullification. This was a very, very uh, deep foreshadowing of things to come in the United States. Now this was a struggle between federal power and state power. The federal power being Andrew Jackson and he was about a strong central government and of course the South Carolina said look this is hurting us the tariffs hurting us. It's our right as a state. 
This goes back to the very beginning of our country. Who should have more power, federal or state? This small video down here is on the nullification crisis too. Please go to page 35. As you know, the Bank of the United States was set up by Alexander Hamilton, and it is still going strong. But every few years, Congress has to agree to reach harder it. Jackson hated the bank. He believed the National Bank made the rich richer and cheated farmers. So, on behalf of the common man, he wanted to kill the bank. And the biggest thing that he has to kill the bank with is a veto. So he vetoes the bank, fighting against many other people that think it's a mistake. He uses his veto power more than any other president at this point. He took out all the government money, killing the bank, and some say illegally. He gives it to all the other state banks. He did this to protect the common man, but at the same time, because the way he took out the money so quickly and dispersed it, things went terribly wrong in the American economy, and they end up going into an economic depression because of it. And this started in his, uh, the next president's um, presidency. All right, so this is a political party, or excuse me, a political cartoon that came out about him. Uh, many people said that he wielded his power like a king, that he was abusing his power. Please look around this uh, political cartoon at the different messages they were sending. Is this a democratic picture of Andrew Jackson or a non-democratic picture? All right. So at this point, we ended the lesson to look at some historical documents on the bank war. So I should have given you the bank war documents already, and that will give you a little bit more of an idea about the bank war. But the big overarching question is, how democratic was Andrew Jackson? Was him killing the bank for the good of the people? Did he do it for the good of the people? And we'll answer that question at the end of the week on Friday. Let me know if you have any questions at all.